Uh, may I now request uh, Dr. Ms. Sumati Parmal to make her presentation on staunching the proliferation of maritime lawfare in the Indo Pacific. Thank you. Good afternoon, and um, let me join all the panelists uh, in thanking uh, NMF and also, uh, in specifically, uh, Prof. Uh, Admiral Chauhan for the invitation and for having me here to give a perspective on uh, the staunch staunching the proliferation of lawfare. But on a caveat, I would like to mention that I'm not a trained uh, lawyer. Uh, by profession, I, I studied international relations and strategic and defense, and I work on maritime security. But in order to address maritime security, I believe that uh, uh, a scholar or, or a researcher need to understand the law. So hence, I will try my best to, to, to address uh, both. I would like to begin by uh, bringing back uh, the excellent presentation of panelists uh, that chaired by Professor Jeffrey Till. And uh, he concluded uh, in his final remarks that the complexity of uh, uh, the domain and the, 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 the multiple uh, interests uh, and uh, the problems that you are facing today, uh, one of it is the lack of governance, uh, and probably governance uh, will be the, the, uh, one of the solution. So uh, I will talk about maritime security governance in the context of uh, maintaining a rules-based, uh, safe, and secure Indo-Pacific. Now, the outline of my presentation is three. The first, I will talk about maritime domain and its governance. Second, I will talk about the strategic development in the Indo-Pacific region. And third, the proliferation of lawfare focusing in the South China Sea. Now, maritime domain. We talk about maritime domain and its governance. It, this has emerged as a critical component in contemporary international relations. This is attributed to the importance of the activities on ocean, prompting greater attention on global superpower and emerging regional powers. The attention is understandable as the domain constitutes the gravity of military passage and the world transportation that has direct impact to international trade and economy, but also to the ecosystem itself. Now, tradi traditionally, when we talk about maritime, sec maritime governance, it has been viewed from a military standpoint and as an area for great powers to expand and strategic in nature. But the notion of maritime and merit, uh, power created the sea power with the idea that a country that able to hold control of the sea could govern the sea as well. In traditional sense, governance is discussed in the context of military history and skillful conduct of nation at sea and to gain control at land. In conventional sense, powerful states dominate the seas and controls the sea lines of communication and the world trade. Realistically, military power and its management is seen as the ultimate in pursuing political and strategic goals. Hence, sea power is an anchor in maritime strategy. But the traditional security uh, as, as you know, security is divided into two. One is the traditional and non-traditional security. So traditional security involving state actors with the aim to safeguard sovereignty and territorial integrity. The goal is towards securing the maritime space from threats that could potentially threaten the state's territorial political sovereignty. Access to waterways has been regarded as a traditional security priority for maritime states dependent on far seas operation. So maintaining a free passage of commerce and energy supplies is an explicit interest of maritime powers. When you talk about non-traditional security and maritime security development in the Indo-Pacific over the decade or so, there are four main components in the Indo-Pacific that have attracted greater attention uh, to the sea lines of communication. So the four uh, pillars or four facets is um, including sustainable and inclusivity in the Indo-Pacific region. When we talk about sustainability and in inclusivity, it's about maintaining the sea lanes, the ecosystem, the well-being of the community living at, uh, you know, adjacent to the seas and so on. And the second pillar is ocean governance. So many uh, Indo-Pacific partners 
uh, India, Japan, uh, US, uh, Australia, and European nation, specifically uh, France separately, uh, EU separately, and also Germany has come up with various Indo-Pacific strategy, and ocean governance has been one of the important uh, component. When you talk about ocean governance, it encompasses uh, marine spatial planning, the domain information that the first and second speakers have alluded earlier, and also the protection of uh, the, uh, the, the resources, the living resources at sea, and so on and so forth. The for third component that uh, has been uh, deliberated uh, yesterday and this uh, for the last three days actually is the safety and security. Uh, in the context of Southeast Asia, I think there was a lot of attention given uh, to, to, to end for especially uh, when you talk about the uh, Straits of Malacca and the literal states, uh, such as uh, literal states of the um, uh, Straits of Malacca, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, have given a detailed in, uh, attention to, to, to give uh, full safety for the uh, commercial vessels as well as, as, well as interrupt. Uh, the, the movement of uh, commercial as well as military ship, and that, that is the facet of uh, sa uh, safety. And security, uh, there was a lot of attention on piracy, uh, non-traditional security issues such as uh, smuggling, uh, movement of illegal movement of uh, humans to sea, uh, illegal movement of contrabands, and so on and so forth. And the, 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 the most important facet of the Indo-Pacific, and uh, when you talk about governance, uh, and I, I believe this is... Uh, brought a lot of attention to especially the Southeast Asian region or the Indo-Pacific region is the rule of law. So uh, one of the critical uh, intervention was this, uh, uh, the arbitration, the 2016, uh, 2016 uh, uh, court uh, ruling on uh, the case uh, between uh, China and uh, Philippines uh, in the South China Sea. And many of this, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, proponent, especially Japan, for example, through its uh, uh, open Indo-Pacific uh, concept, has been uh, folk, uh, giving a lot of awareness, attention, so that the rule of law prevails uh, in the maritime domain. But in my own assessment, uh, the, the, the governance, the focus, the governance, and uh, the perspective on maritime domain has shifted. And there is two, two major contributes to the shift that has changed how the Southeast Asian maritime region is uh, viewed, or the Indo-Pacific region. That is the excessive uh, exercise of lawfare and definitely the strategic uh, competition between the great powers. So when you talk about st strategic competition, definitely there is a, there is a big block of Indo-Pacific nation uh, and also uh, in China you would observe the trend of many Indo-Pacific conferences that I've attended personally uh, is talking about China uh, and without having China. And uh, I think uh, uh, it is, uh, is something uh, that uh, shows that uh, in the Indo-Pacific, the strategic competition is uh, very clear. Now, one of the uh, most recent strategic development is uh, China has raised its concern over Japan's plan to strengthen its deployment of its self-defense uh, forces in the Kyushu uh, with 7.7 uh, uh, trillion yen of uh, fiscal budget. And also China thinks that uh, this deemed to be a military threat uh, in Okinawa and Taiwan Straits. And the second uh, development is the Camp David uh, trilateral uh, 2023 between US, Japan, and Korea summit labeling China as dangerous and aggressive. <coughs> AUKUS and Quad. Uh, definitely, uh, AUKUS uh, is important for the US, Australia, uh, and also UK. Uh, uh, there's, there's been a lot of discussion in, in, in Indonesia and Malaysia as to how AUKUS, whether AUKUS it will be a threat for the peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific uh, Indo region, or whether uh, you know, uh, it, is, it is something to balance uh, China's, rise, uh, China's uh, dangerous rise in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and uh, uh, there are also discussion uh, in, in that part of the region uh, talking about what is uh, Quad and whether Quad would actually undermine ASEAN relevance in managing a peaceful Southeast Asian maritime domain. 
So uh, uh, if you would observe that ASEAN has recently conducted a solidarity exercise, ASEC uh, 2023, with the first of kind where all the ASEAN uh, 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 militaries came together for a joint exercise, although the background to it was a search and rescue and a humanitarian disaster exercise, but ASEAN, uh, ASEAN being an institution and a ASEAN uh, usually when you compare ASEAN to NATO, you know, uh, we will usually uh, or, or very firmly say ASEAN is not a military bloc or ASEAN is not like NATO and we don't have military forces and so on and so forth. But ASEAN has to come together to conduct a joint uh, exercise and I think this is uh, something uh, to be uh, observed, whether ASEAN will be uh, forming uh, a new form of uh, exercises uh, in various uh, areas in the maritime domain. So ASEAN joint realms, although focused on humanitarian exercises, that there, there, there are uh, some uh, uh, concerns whether it, it could develop uh, in, the, in, in the future to a more uh, uh, mili militarized based uh, exercises. Now, uh, moving on to the South China Sea, uh, I, I'm sure uh, the, the audience are well aware there is uh, increasing traditional security risk. As I, as I mentioned, although there are, there are importance of uh, other security issues uh, of late, the focus has been on, uh, on traditional security risk that is based on uh, different countries' uh, uh, interest, uh, national interests. And also, uh, if you look at uh, South China Sea, uh, there are many converging interests, uh, specifically the claimant states, the uh, five, five claimants in the Spratly Islands, uh, in the uh, parcel between Vietnam and China, and also in the Scarborough Shoal between Philippines and China. And also, if you, you look at the other facet, is the Indo-Pacific uh, interest to maintain the open commerce uh, in the South China Sea and also to balance the aggressive uh, emergence of China that could potentially uh, become a, a power that, that may want to dominate uh, the, the maritime seas in the South, uh, Southeast Asia. And also worrying uh, reality that uh, the claimants and also Southeast Asian countries are facing is the increasing Chinese uh, assertiveness in the South China Sea. So there are three important uh, convergence of interest, and that this interest has also uh, diluted uh, the maritime governance that was, was focused on uh, non-traditional issues to traditional security issues. Now moving on very briefly on proliferation of lawfare, uh, you can see on the slides that a number of uh, activities or number of issues that have actually caught uh, real concerns for uh, claimants, uh, including uh, like Malaysia, Vietnam, Philippines, and so on, Chinese, uh, Chinese, uh, China, and Vietnam's, uh, uh, you know, incidents uh, of vanguard from 2014, 2012, 2013, and so on. And the most recent one is the uh, the two most recent one is the uh, Chinese new Coast Guard law and the Chinese 2023 edition of the new standard map, which Malaysia have uh, uh, protested and clearly stated that that new map will not have any impact on, on us. Now, uh, um, more focus on uh, coming from Malaysia, I think the issues and challenges uh, is also the same for Malaysia as to Vietnam and Philippines, uh, maybe other, other nations operating at South China Sea. Uh, in the Malaysian case, we have uh, this detection of a Chinese Coast Guard vessel accompanied by a Chinese uh, Navy survey ships, cruise ship, and also carrying CCP members on board uh, in Malaysian waters. And uh, so this is actually enforcement plus civilian ship uh, alongside with military operating very close to our area. And China challenging the action uh, of other, other operating uh, law enforcement agency through its transcripts and asserting that uh, the waters claimed by China should get permission from, uh, from Chinese authority for us to even operate in our own area. And in the post-arbitration, uh, I, as I observe that the legal posturing in Malaysia waters is, is becoming a concern, uh, both in the, uh, in the case of dealing with IUU fishing and also uh, in, uh, in executing law enforcement activities. China has also given notice to Marina uh, through its Navigation Guarantee Department of China, indicating that uh, you know, uh, trying to assert 
uh, its own authority in the area that is be, uh, not within their jurisdiction. So um, to deal with the multifaceted uh, issues that I have mentioned earlier, uh, uh, in, uh, to come up with a maritime security government perspective, there are existing legal uh, responses and also institutional uh, responses. Uh, uh, the speaker earlier, Dr. Lan An, have mentioned about the uh, arbitration and also the legal aspect of it. I will just uh, uh, speak a little bit of, of the institutional uh, responses. There are national laws that each and uh, uh, each country can de deal with China and also any other countries that violating or encroaching into our area. There are also bilateral arrangements, minilateral, uh, the emergence of minilateral arrangement uh, is also one of those things that are uh, occurring in, in the Southeast Asian domain. Uh, there are also UNCLOS, uh, as, as mentioned by the previous speaker. UNCLOS provides for a broad principle for ocean governance and uh, it provides a framework for to deal with every is aspect of uh, maritime security. And there are also other uh, regimes, treaties and agreements such as uh, in the Straits of Malacca we have a recap uh, agreement which Malaysia is not yet a uh, full member. But the, the, the existing, there are existing uh, treaties and agreements. But the problem is all claimants are party to UNCLOS, the claimants in the South China Sea, but not all stakeholders are party to UNCLOS. For example, it's quite clear that U.S. is not a party to UNCLOS, and that perhaps, uh, although U.S. Uh, says that uh, it will, it, uh, it, the U.S. Uh, freedom of navigation in activities are in line with uh, customary international law and also UNCLOS and so forth, I think the reality is uh, not all parties that have uh, very uh, strong interest in the South China Sea are party to UNCLOS. Even then, China is a party to UNCLOS, but whether China adhere to the uh, UNCLOS and international law, that is another question that uh, has been uh, going on. So the Declaration of Conduct of Parties, DOC, in the South China Sea, um, the, the concern is whether uh, the, the DOC is, uh, is effective, and uh, as of now, the comments and the observation has been that both uh, DOC and COC is uh, ineffective and uh, this, do this institutional uh, agreement or, 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 or progress or are work in progress. Basically that um, although uh, post DOC we have seen many, many, uh, uh, the number of uh, um, military infrastructure, you know, facilities have been built that is, is not uh, in line with what countries have agreed within the DOC. So in conclusion, the strategic environment is becoming too complex uh, faced with multidimensional challenges and the strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific is expected to dominate the governing approaches in the South China Sea in the mid to long term. So as I mentioned, the strategic the competition, it is not only about China that is becoming more aggressive, but also the corresponding uh, 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 concepts or emerging interests of other uh, Indo-Pacific partners is is, big, is 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 a problem that will uh, the where where ASEAN members or smaller states in Southeast Asia have to deal with, and excessive exercises of lawfare significantly impact resource security, including energy and the sustainable management of the living resources. Uh, so maritime, uh, maritime governance, uh, it also affects uh, effective maritime governance uh, by, uh, by any individual state uh, or by multilateral or regional institutions. So for example, Malaysia, we have enough law or adequate law to govern fisheries issues. The 1985 Fisheries Act actually governs uh, the fisheries issues and also the MMEA 2004 Act could govern the fisheries issues. But because of the unresolved maritime dispute and the uh, excessive uh, claims by China and also other countries in the overlapping area, it becomes more complex for us to deal with the particular issue. So uh, with that, I, uh, I look forward to the discussion session and thank you so much for your attention.